Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to the Talk in Deen podcast. I am your host Majid and today I have some special guests with me, brother Tanim and uh, brother Yaqub all the way from Turkey. How are you brothers? Alhamdulillah. Salam alaikum. How are you? Alhamdulillah I'm well. Brother, yes. brother Yaqub. Assalamu uh, alaikum bro. It's so, uh, wonderful to be here. And just a bit of introduction, Brother Yaqub is uh, uh, a Ottoman historian and uh, subhanAllah, we, you know, really grateful for getting a slot in uh, busy times for you because I know in this past week, I think you recorded about five podcasts. Yeah, yeah it's been crazy. Hagia Sophia has uh, turned everything on its head. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So how, so you, obviously you're here in the UK for a while, you're residing in Turkey at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, so I live in Turkey. Um, I haven't had time to come home since the COVID pandemic. Mm. I wanted to make sure my folks were okay. So um, it was just... Um, come home, see everyone's. I mean, physically they're fine, nothing's happened, but just emotionally to make sure that everything was okay, and then catch up with friends and family. I don't often get to see people. Whenever I come here, it's a one week stint, and so many people to see. So on this occasion, I have a couple more weeks. Yeah, yeah. Subhanallah. Mm. And obviously, you mentioned about you know the the podcast and the yeah. Hagia Sophia, and uh, we've seen that actually with Turkey mm. over the recent years, it's been in in the the media. Whether you had the uh, the issue to do when Turkey down the Russian jet, yeah, or you had the issue to do with the the coup, uh, yeah. attempted coup, yeah, um, and since then there's been the issue in uh, Syria, Libya now, mm-hmm. and Hagia Hagia Sophia. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think it's important to uh, look at this issue because the world is divided on this, yeah. and even within Muslims there's a, a division mm-hmm. because what Turkey, um, what some people are or seeing Turkey as today is it represents something which is linked to Islam, <laughs> okay? Whilst other people just see Turkey or the AK Party mm-hmm. as uh, opportunists mm-hmm. who are just using uh, rhetoric mm-hmm. for votes and so on. And then in regards to the international community, mm-hmm. we see that people accuse um, Turkey of going down a neo-Ottomanism route, mm-hmm. okay? So it will be good to discuss what it is, how it is on the ground, because obviously you live in Turkey as well. Right. So the, the first question I want to, you know, uh, ask uh, that we can discuss mm-hmm. is in regards to uh, the Turkish history of Ottomanism. Right. What's the relevance with it today? Because the reason why I ask that is, you know, like, for example, in Italy, mm-hmm. you don't have people calling for the return of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we see that after 1924, mm-hmm. the uh, Ottoman Halifi was abolished and people would think that you move on now. Uh, Turkey became a secular state. Mm-hmm. But now the fact that uh, you have the AK Party or Erdogan or generally people uh, pushing a uh, Ottoman link to the past. Right. W- what's the relevance of this? Um, okay. Um, first of all, I just want to start off by um, really actually saying thank you for giving me the platform. As, uh, <laughs> I don't enjoy room. doing these things, but uh, it's always nice to, to have your opinion, well, one's opinion to support. Um, in Turkey's case, what's unique about Turkey, unlike in the parallels with Italy in that perspective is that the Turkey is perceived as the successor state of the Ottomans. So you have a collapse of the Ottoman domains and then Turkey becomes a successor state as a result of that. Mm-hmm. But it's not only Turkey. Turkey is just perceived as a successor state because Istanbul was in Turkey. But the Balkans and the Arab provinces by and large from Libya, parts of Algeria, um, Yemen, uh, the Hejaz, Bilad Sham, the Balkans and Anatolia, um, had an Ottoman past, and all of those nations, in some shape or form, still resonate with an Ottoman past that hasn't left them. Mm-hmm. And the Ottoman past has never left Turkey. I mean, even when we talk about Kemalism as an idea or an ideology, it emanates from a response or a reaction to the Ottoman project. So, when you come to Istanbul, the skyline is Ottoman. Mm. So, in that sense, Ot- the Ottoman presence, which in Istanbul has been for about four or five hundred years has never left that part of the world. And that is still part of the identity, even though the formation of the Turkish Republic tried to create a new identity. Mm. That that identity is very difficult to to rupture in that sense. So that's why it's still relevant in that part of the world. And that's why the debates are still there. And that's why, in some ways, I try to explain to people that history hasn't ended. This assumption that just history ends. We're still here. We exist. Mm -hmm. And so as a result of that, this continuation, this is just another continuation of that five, six hundred year period. So... That, that's why it's still quite vibrant and relevant here. Whereas in the case of the Italians, I mean, the Roman Empire ended a long time ago, right? Um, let's look at Britain. And we, we're here in Britain right now. I mean, there is a residual 
Britain is a residual empire in the sense that it's not empire, but there's a, a mm. perception in people who live in Britain that this is still empire in oh, terms yeah. of identity. So it hasn't left them, you see. So even though the, the colonial empire has collapsed, mm. that identity in Britain is very strong. Mm. And I talk about this regarding Muslims, which is Muslims and non-Muslims who live in Britain. There's still a difference in regards to how you identify with being British vis-a-vis empire, right? So in a lot of people who are non-Muslim, um, or are not migrant Muslims anyway, the, the perception is queen and country. That was a construction in the British world um, to try to create this idea of en- an identity of being British belonging to empire. And you'll see Piers Morgan on, on television, yeah, you know, yeah. pushing that. Mm. But ethnic minorities find it harder to subscribe to that. Why? Because to some degree, they don't have that, that historical baggage or that historical attachment. So it's not only Turkey in that sense. It's Britain, it's France and so forth. So you see that. Yeah, mm. just want to ask you, mm. is it, because Ottomanism is it's a culture, and mm-hmm. uh, when you just explained that just now, mm-hmm. it it's a culture that, you know, pe- people will live by, and it, it, will st- it will stay with them for, for many, many years, and it will carry on, just mm. like you mentioned Britain mm. and Italy, you know, wherever you go. The thing is, is how much can you say and relate this mm. to actually, are they Islamic sentiments? Or are, is it just a culture? Because that there's a two distinction there that I think that we need to make. Yeah, I mean, let's get it's very exciting for yeah. a lot of us because when we hear all of this stuff coming out of yeah. Turkey, it's very very exciting because we feel, or especially yeah. myself, when you look at it, the Islamic Ummah, there's, we've had a, there's been a bashing. Yeah, sure. You know, we've been bashed. We've been sure. we're literally on our knees because yeah. it's like anyone can say anything about Islam and get away mm. with it these days. Mm-hmm. Do you know, what I feel, and I'm f- I'm finding out anything positive Islamic related that comes out from Turkey. There's a bit of a hype, and we all get excited, and I get excited as yeah. well. But I just want to understand is how true is that? How close is that to the Islamic sentiments that we? Okay. that we're getting excited about. It, if I'm understanding the question correctly, and if I'm not understanding it correctly, then you can just step in. Sure. Um, you can't um, abolish an identity that's been part of your makeup for that long, overnight. So let's talk about the nation state, Syria or Palestinians. They identify being Syrians or Palestinians. That's a new construction of an mm-hmm. identity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it will be very hard or it would be irrational to assume that even though the Palestinian state may not come into fruition or the Syrian state might come bust, or the Syrian identity may be different, that people can no longer subscribe to being Syrian. They may subscribe to being Syrian for at least another two, three, four, five generations. Now, in the Ottoman case, when we're talking about it being a culture, but it's not only a culture, it was a state, it was an entity, it was a civilization in that sense. To lose that identity over a couple of generations is not plausible, right? And any remnant of Islam in Turkey cannot come from a vacuum. It has to come from predating pre-existing things. What is that? That's the Ottoman past. So any call to Islam that's going to be made in Turkey, it cannot be done via the rejection of the Ottoman past. That wouldn't make sense. It's irrational to assume that. So what do you call back on? You draw back on the identity that pre-exists. You're still using the masajids. What are the masajids? The Ottoman masajids, right? Um, a lot of the culture that exists in, in regarding Islam in Turkey, in Syria, in Iraq, in the Balkans, is Ottoman. So you can't just... Um, do away with that, unless it's some an extreme violent break. And we've seen some of those violent breaks in places like Albania, Kosovo, where extreme forms of communism came communism, to Albania yeah. and so forth. But nevertheless, even in a place like Albania, mm-hmm. you still see that. And the reason why I mention Albania is because when the wars happened, a lot of fighters came from the Hijaz, mainly from Saudi Arabia, or money came from Saudi Arabia, and mm-hmm. a new type of Islam was being sponsored. Having said that, the Albanian identity is still strongly attached to an Ottoman past. To be Albanian comes from the Ottoman past. Without that, it doesn't exist. Would you say that with the Ottomanism or mm. their history? Mm. So as, as an example, you know when the Hagia Sophia was, yeah. uh, uh, when it was uh, re, re, renamed into a masjid, right? Yeah. You had the MHP party, I'm sure yeah. it is, the nationalists. Yeah. Okay, They were behind this. In fact, what a lot of people said was that it showed the sentiment on the ground that mm. if anyone actually was against this, they would have been seen as anti-Turk. Yeah. But, see, this is the issue here. Mm. Would they would they have been seen anti-Turkish from a nationalist point of view mm-hmm. or anti-Islamic? So the point is, it could well be that over the years of Kemalism and all this stuff, mm. that even the people that aspire back to the Ottoman state, mm. 
um, they link it to maybe um, you know uh, having the dream of being an imperial power again. Maybe not Islamically, mm-hmm. or would you say the issue of Ottoman, the legacy of Ottomans, and mm-hmm. and the call for Ottomanism now mm-hmm. um, is uh, linked directly to Islam? I think it's blurry. Is the honest answer to that question? I think it's exceptionally blurry. I mean, the way that I um, explain Turkish society and politics and society is a kaleidoscope of different factions. Uh, there's an assumption that it's just Kemalism versus Islam. That's mm-hmm. not actually how Turkish state and society operates. Um, and so, what's happened in the Turkish political spectrum is that very rarely do you get uh, a symbol that can unify a large group of people. Within that kaleidoscope or that umbrella, true, yeah, yeah. right. What Hagia Sophia did is it, it managed to unify different factions within the Turkish elites: those who were nationalists, those who were, who were perceived as being Islamically inclined, those who were pragmatists, mm-hmm. those who felt that this is for the defense of the the state mm-hmm. because we're in a dangerous neighborhood and so forth. To some degree, they rec- there was a recognition that this building as a symbol can galvanize many factions within Turkish society. Mm-hmm. Um, for others, they just didn't care about it that much anymore. It, mm-hmm. The the struggle for it to remain a museum was no longer relevant. So um, in that sense, a lot has happened in Turkey in, in regards to the Hagia Sophia issue. Now, what, what the point I'm making is that there are very few symbols that can do that. And in fairness to Tayyip Erdogan, as the, the president of the Turkish Republic, throughout his time as leader of the state, he has managed to balance this umbrella, shifting umbrella, shifting factions, shifting elites, okay. and managed to consolidate his authority and at the same time keeping various factions happy. Under the failed military coup attempt on July the 15th, there was an impression or an assumption that to bring what we would call the nationalists on board was far more safer for the protection of the state and society than to be in contestation with them. But the nationalists are not just nationalists. You've got to understand, they're on a spectrum in of themselves. Like umbrella. It's a, it's a strange spectrum that you can right. have, from one extreme here you can have nationalists who can be quite critical of Islam mm-hmm. and on the other hand you can have nationalists who are very pro-Islam and so forth yeah, 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 yeah. and as a result of that that national they, it's called the Turkish Islamic synthesis it's quite complicated but um, it's on any given day it's difficult to know what the emotion is going to be because the things are changing in the environment so far so quickly that human emotions are quite unpredictable in that sense so it's still very hard to know. The, I mean, I know I haven't answered your question, but the idea, is it Islamically inclined or is it nationalistically inclined? Because in Turkey, I think Turkey is probably one of the few countries that I've seen, because I lived in the Arab world too, where nationalism and Islam have found a strange synthesis. Like Pakistan, I think. Mm. But Pakistan's different. Degree. I'll tell you why. Because when you're to be Pakistani, there's not an ethnicity there. There's not a language there. You understand? Mm. But what yeah, does Pakistan mean? Yes, yes, yes. In that sense. But to be a Turk, it has this remnant of the mm-hmm. Ottoman past. Turk is an ethnicity. Turkish is a language mm-hmm. and so forth. So it's still a, a unique nation state model in that context. Um, Pakistan emerges from the fallout of the Ottomans, it's true. And they built a nation for Muslims. But Turkey is still really unique. And in, in that sense, um, in regards to the other nations, um, it's really hard on any given day to say how much of this is Turkish and how much of this is Islamic because to some degree there's a merger and there's a mesh that's taking place. Okay. Yeah, cool. Mm. I mean, I, absolutely correct. Mm. I, I, I can see where you come from on that one. There is also an opinion, mm-hmm. and I don't know if you agree with this or not, is whichever way you see it, because yeah. it's interesting now we're asking this question about mm. Islamic sentiments. Mm. Obviously, there's one party that's talking about one side will, will highlight uh, this is to do with uh, nationalism. I mm-hmm. uh, doing it because mm-hmm. of that's what mm-hmm. the people want uh, mm-hmm. to, to do. You know, it's all about nationalism. Mm-hmm. And then the other side mm-hmm. is it, the Islamic sentiments that people want it because mm-hmm. of the attachment of mm-hmm. Islam and what have you. Mm-hmm. Whichever way you look at it, the point of the matter is is even if Adaran was to do it based on, you know, the people want it, mm. you can still look at it from that perspective that because it's related to Islam, mm. it really gives Muslims a big massive boost, doesn't mm. it? And then even if he's doing it, mm. e- even if it's pushed by by Muslims, in, mm. in you know, because for Islamic reasons, I mean, that's still a good thing. So whichever yeah. way you look mm. at it, 
the positives I take from this, because mm-hmm. this is why there's such a hype around it, mm-hmm. is that whichever way you look at it, whether Adrian did it for his own political reasons, which, mind you, the West media is, mm-hmm. is trying to portray, and or whether it's done for Islamic reasons, I mean, it's good whichever way you look at it. That's, mm-hmm. that's the way I, I mean, for I, I me, see like, I don't know, how, what would you think? So for me, as a historian, one of the things I've noticed is that we have a very... Uh, those who don't study history seem to not realise... The idea of the instrumentalization of Islam by people who are in authority. Yeah, there's this idea that when you're in political authority, that somehow you you're not you're you're not permitted to use the symbols or the language or the rhetoric of Islam to galvanize the masses. Now, on on any given occasion, you may use that language to galvanize masses yeah. to go to war, pay a particular tax or what. And on occasion, leaders have used those emotions and to galvanize the masses for their own project and agenda. That's going to happen. Mm. And when Islam and politics are so intermeshed in that way. Mm. It's very difficult to to make the call um, or the assumption that on any given day that this is just simply a rhetorical device That's being true. used to. That's right. And even if it is, even if it is, let's just say it is, but there's the agency of the mass. The mass has an agency. It understands by and large what's going on and it's choosing and it's willing to then participate in this. Mm-hmm. And that has to be understood. So the way that I look at it, when we're talking about Isofia once again, is that um, if that's how Muslims feel regards to what happened in the Hagia Sophia move, I think we should understand what Muslims want. And if Erdogan, for whatever reason, has decided to use this as a symbol, as a way of consolidating his authority, and I don't believe that's happened, because if he would have done that, he would have done it two years later, because that's when the elections are coming. So right now it doesn't make sense. Yeah, so something else is going on okay, right? in that context. But the Muslim emotion in and in of itself requires some... It, respect in that sense and so I always try to look at the positives and say okay how do the Muslims feel from here That's and right. when a move like this has been made and the reason why Turkey becomes very unique now in the last five years is when you see the sta- states like the UAE Saudi Arabia in particular in Egypt mm. who not only attacking them but have chosen to to be more um, di- distant regarding Islam as their identity yes. especially in the case of Saudi Arabia who used Islam for a very long time in regards yeah. to their identity are now choosing that we're going to distance ourselves from Islam. Islam is going to be a religion. It's not going to be part of our political agenda anymore. And when you see a state like Turkey that recognizes that actually Islam is important for our identity, it's not only Turkey, you see it in Pakistan and Malaysia mm-hmm. also, that you can now start to see the fault lines where in some societies um, there is a significant segment in those societies where they believe that Islam should be more active in the running of some of the decision-making processes. Now, that's interesting. Now, nothing may come out of that. That's possible. Mm. But the age, when you sort of get the ball rolling in any given society, interesting things can happen. It's a, it's a process, isn't it? I mean, yeah, you, yeah. you know, like the point you made, Tanim, I think in regards to when I first heard about this news, and to be honest, I was really happy because I've been there and like the same way I've been to uh, Granada and to Alhambra Palace. Mm-hmm. And you feel really sad just just seeing the Quranic eyes and stuff and the history of what happened to the Muslims there. But the thing is, is that you know, I, I personally disconnected this from Ak Party or just say mm-hmm. from Erdogan. As Muslims, this symbol, you know, at that time Constantinople was Hagia Sophia and Hagia Sophia was Constant That's Constantinople. Right, yeah. So also people, you know, sometimes you can be armchair critics sitting here safely. People have experienced Kemalism, yeah. right? And then on top of that, what you got to understand is when. Uh, Erdogan's party lost to those three important cities, uh, the mayorship in 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 uh, Turkey, certainly in Istanbul with the uh, Imamoglu, hmm. Giza, and what we saw is that this, um, you know, a lot of the sec the Kemalist or secularists, they got emboldened. Hmm. They were coming out and they were you know coming out and they were attacking people, saying, "Yeah, it's all over for you. Now time is going to change." Hmm. So I was thinking about that the other day that you know with this Hagia Sophia thing. Mm-hmm. To me, it's also where, you know, this is a, you know, that fear, because I've spoken to people from there and they were saying, you know, what they were saying is that things can't go back to how they were, mm-hmm. but we feel that there's going to be something, something's great going to happen, like something's going to have to give. But this also, to be honest, restored a bit of honor for them, I think, mm-hmm. you know, to, to show to them that, you know, but the point that you're saying, uh, Brother Yakub, that what do the people want? Yeah. And what we can clearly see is they never opened a, um, uh, or museum, or they have an, they open a mosque, mm-hmm. a mosque that's linked to the you know the 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 conqueror of Istanbul, linked to conquest, jihad, and all these sort of the feelings right. that Muslims have, these mm-hmm. emotions. So, I think uh, yes, I don't think you can say exactly whether this action, this particular day, is for what reason. 
But in the greatest, great, uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, the, in the big picture, we see that this is a positive for, for Islam. And you know, like, obviously, mm. you're, you live in there, mm. uh, Brother Yacoub, yeah? So your interaction with people, because yeah. I remember years and years and years ago, yeah. I was always told Turkey is secular. Yeah, yeah. Until I visited there and I realized, look, it's not a secular as people said, yeah. right? Yeah. So on the ground, your general interaction mm-hmm. with people, mm-hmm. what's the vibe in regards to, are people getting closer to Islam? Once again, it's a difficult one. And I'll tell you why. I mean, you, you said uh, Imam al Giza, I like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, actually, Imam is a reflection of something really interesting in Turkish society. Imam Olu, um, as the mayor of Istanbul, probably won it because pe- there was a sense of frustration in Istanbul uh, regarding uh, the government's policies. Mm-hmm. As it has, it's a very young population, and uh, there was a, we'd have to accept a particular protest vote that took place where they voted by abstaining from voting. Um, and then the, Turkey is really interesting because a lot of tactical voting happened. But the reason why I mentioned Imam Olu is because Imam Olu had to walk into um, Ayub and read Quran. Yes. Okay, so what you see in one hand is you see even the opposition has recognized that um, there has to be a particular Islamic um, rhetorical use as a way of being accepted within mainstream Turkish society now. Um, it, for example, I, we don't believe that the headscarf is ever now going to be banned again in Turkey. It doesn't look plausible. Having said that, um, the current government um, in included neoliberal policies within Turkish society. And with that came a lot of problems in regards to um, capitalism, neoliberalism, materialism, individualism. And there is a fear amongst the conservative members of Turkish society that the young people in particular are being exposed to a form of capitalism which is very American in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so there's a fear of loss of values, loss of morality, Mm -hmm. loss of ethics and so forth. So on the one hand, when you politically, one could assume that there is an upward term but on the other hand, there is an assumption that on the ground, uh, a lot of young people are going to be lost in regards to um, reflecting certain trends that are pop- prominent in Western societies. So once again, it's, it's tricky. I'm not trying to avoid your question. The point I'm trying to make is that um, on any given day, I mean, I don't like to use the word, are the ummah reviving right now? And people always say, so why, why not? I say, let's just keep working. I, I'm just interested in just... Get your head down. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Because we saw what happened in Egypt. We saw what happened in Syria. And now with the Hagia Sophia move, Muslims will be excited. And if something negative happens in the region, Mm. and it is a very dangerous region, um, Muslims can become exceptionally despondent. So as a result of that, you say, all right, let's just move away from that. Get your head down. Keep working in the communities that we're in. Keep working in the societies we're in. And just let's keep going forward and make an assessment of where we're at in any given day. But it's up and down, peaks and troughs, to be honest with you. SubhanAllah. Yaku, mm. so you obviously live in there. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you, do you honestly feel mm. that in Turkey, Turkey are championing the flag of Islam? Because if you ask me, because I can only pass judgment yeah. from being outside of the country, yeah. living mm. in the UK, and obviously I really haven't really got yeah. a truth. I can only tell you what's happening here. Yeah. And from what's happening in terms of the vibes that people think, the, the talk people that I speak to, you know, they're very much excited about, you know, Turkey mm-hmm. leading that flag of Islam, if you like. But I want to know from you, is do you, do you believe that's the case? I mean, if you think that's the case, then that's the case in a strange way. I because that's that. part I, of... I love that answer. Because, <laughs> no, but in, in some way, that's part of the, the, the projection, which is, it's not just an internal audience. This, this act was done for an external audience as well. 100%. Right? So it's, it's about making a particular... Um, so the interesting thing about Hagia Sophia, it's local, it's translocal, and it's transregional. Mm. The idea, this is why this, this building becomes unique, because it's very layered. So on the one hand, yes, if externally people, Muslims around the world, there is a sentiment or an emotion or a belief that Turkey has now decided to become a representative of some sort of Islamic emotion, mm. then I think that the Turkish government knew that it was going to do that. It was It's recognized that. Having said that, on the ground, it can still go any other way. Um, you know, I mean... We still have a very secular military. We still have um, strong secular components within Turkish society. I mean, if that was the case, you know, we would have had the Sharia tomorrow. That's not happening. So the point I'm making, and Turkish society is still very complicated. Like um, they did a poll quite recently and 70 to 80 percent of Turks still are not interested in having a caliphate in Turkey. Right. I think, I think it's about it was a bit less than that, wasn't it? That's more so now. OK. OK, but that, that tells you something. And it always, always comes down to. Now, why, why have they made that case? And the reason being is because who are you interviewing? 
and yeah, okay. right and and so forth that also becomes important and then what does that mean to people uh, in that sense and there's still a baggage and a fear in terms of you know um what's going to happen in the region so um yes for many muslims i can see why they're positive i would personally say hold on to your horses a little bit because um while muslims are very positive across the board um we still have very little um ability to pull together as a collective right now and if something mm-hmm. happens to turkey then then we're in trouble in that sense so, so you know like obviously you you there's a battle between secularism and islam we know that right it's been going on for a while now so where turkey was as in kemalism you'd say is like an extreme form of secularism right okay yeah, yeah? so could it well be that you know the the transition from there and it could well be that this is a process mm. leading towards what the the actual islam is right but it could well be that there are people now that they can wear head scarf and they can do certain things which they wouldn't do before yet they they're quite away from the islam that we would think a khalifa would represent and maybe there is maybe Because I remember speaking to a, a, a Turkish boy, he's Kurdish, but he was he was against Turkey. Mm-hmm. And once he said to me, he said, it was a bad thing when Erdogan came to power. Mm-hmm. And I, I said, why? And what his point was, he said, before, the fault lines mm-hmm. were clear between Kemalazm yeah. and Islam. Mm-hmm. And when this guy came on the scene, he was representing a certain view, but in reality, mm-hmm. he was pushing the same line. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what it is maybe it's a softer version of secularism, mm-hmm. opposed to Kemalism, which is which right now Muslims weren't accepting in mm-hmm. Turkey, for example. You can see this over the times. So, like you're saying, maybe it is a case of hold on to your horses, and a lot of work must be done mm-hmm. on the ground, as in what, because also Turkey is a uh, is it would it be true to say, brother uh, brother Cube, that it's Suf, uh, it's uh, you know it leans more towards Sufism, or was that an old thing? Um, it's still. Quite comp- I mean, there are a lot of what would they call um, a lot of tariqats that are still there. Like so, there are a lot of like jamats mm. in particular um, that are Sufi inclined. Yeah, and that's been a mainstay in Turkey society, even in terms of their politics. Um, in the case of Erdogan, I think when Erdogan came to power, he couldn't have done any other politics but the one that the framework that was given to him. Um, somebody who's going to come into power in Turkey had to come under the secular ticket. That was just. The, the, even now, that's the way the republic works. Um, the question has always been whether Erdogan has been trying to Islamize the society or not. Um, in some, as I said before, in some factions we can see that that is possible. Yeah, uh, yeah. But in other factions, there has been a expose exposure from the conservative class to a form of liberalism that wouldn't have happened in the past. So I can see your friend's argument about the fault lines being clear. When the fault lines were clear, conservatives or people who were of that type of Islamic sentiment stayed very closed in their block. Yes. What Erdogan ha- had managed to do by attaining power, by allowing Muslims to go into power, they've gone into the machinery w- whose culture is secularism. And so now those who were closed off from the access of mm. power have now had the capacity to go into power and gradually that form of secular culture has seeped into their culture. So the fault line is no longer there. But on the same token, that secular space has also become embracing towards many Islamic symbols and so forth. So what Erdogan has done is, I think it's fair, or not Erdogan, but the AK party coming into power, is they've made that secular Islamic line a lot more blurrier. Kemalism, in some fairness, um, tried to facilitate for a version of Islam in the way they saw it. That's why Islam still managed to survive, so but it was a lot harsher. Mm. Um, in the last 20 years, those lines have become a lot blurrier. And so that's part of the problem now. So when people are asking... Where where do you sit on Islam and nationalism or Islam and secularism? These binaries are a lot harder to pull out because you will find somebody who's exceptionally religious and at the same time a supporter of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. So how does that work? Mm. And and then the new complication is the Syrian migration, which a lot of people don't realize. The, the huge influx of Syrian migrants coming to the country. Not only Syrian migrants coming to the country, but members of the Muslim Brotherhood coming into Istanbul because they have nowhere else to go but to be exiled into Istanbul. And Istanbul becoming a sort of like a, a a space for Muslim exiles, Muslim thinkers, and so forth also come in there. So it's made it quite complicated in terms of these debates and so forth. In terms of um, different people are bringing different things to the table in Turkish society. But right now, um, 
I think the jury will. I think it's easy to critique Erdogan right now. I think in five, ten years time, I think we'll have a better assessment of what he did over his twenty year rule. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. of course. So what of Abdagan now? What do you think he needs to do now to still remain and have the support of his people? I think he has the support of his major constituent. I don't think they will ever leave him. That's because he was somebody that came from the grassroots. Mm. And that's important to understand. A lot of people don't realize that in Turkish society, what Erdogan had done, which politicians in the past hadn't done, is he came from the grassroots movement. So that sentiment's never going to leave him. In terms of his legacy, his legacy is a complicated one. Um... There are many good things he's done. There's many forms of things he's done that people will criticize. Um, I think my personal opinion is, I think um, his reign is probably coming to an end, mm-hmm. um, which that might surprise some people. But I, I think, and this is just a guess, and I'm speculating, that he's given his country 20 years, and Hagia Sophia was the last move, and Hagia Sophia is a goodbye. What, what would you say would be his legacy? I mean, I think for Muslims in Turkey, his legacy would be that um, Muslims came into power. Um, Muslims had the capacity to come into power in their capacity as Muslims. Um, I think for Muslims, that would be his major legacy. They were, now, conservative Muslims, or ultra-conservative Muslims, will be critical of him um, in, in some shape or form. And some people make the argument that near the end of his reign, um, the, the system became a lot more restrictive. Um, but those who support him will say that that was necessary and that was needed um, in Turkey at this moment in time because of what's happening in the region. So, you know, you know you're talking about the, the legacy and stuff, right? Now, isn't Turkey um, now uh, in a really important stage because you've got elections coming in 2023, okay? Now, all these uh, presidential powers, as an example, that Erdogan um, passed through, okay, which gave him that, that power. Now, they're there. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a couple of elements when we talk about uh, the departure of Erdogan because if he was to depart yeah. and and uh, even if AK Party won the elections, mm-hmm. you know, is there anyone uh, charismatic enough to fill that void? Mm-hmm. But also, just say that they, the AK Party lost elections because obviously, you know, there was the splinter groups that mm-hmm. broke off mm-hmm. forming there, you know. Now, from a Muslim point of view, because the reality is, is that maybe someone may say, look, it's... It, the situation is best of a bad apple. When you talk about leaders in the Muslim world, people will say, yeah, look, the guy's got his faults, but he's better than the rest, mm-hmm. right? And especially with the Hagia Sophia movement stuff like that, people now have, you know, become emboldened. Some people are talking about 2023 and the 100 years mm-hmm. are going to be going and, and Turkey will, you know, become this. And But the problem is now for that psyche, the, the Muslim psyche, now they crash out in 2023. Mm-hmm. And within Turkey... You know, maybe now there's a fault line that the Americans play with, as an example, mm-hmm. which is the uh, you know uh, the secularists against the Muslims, mm-hmm. right? But globally, because this isn't just an issue of Turkey, globally people people love him. I mean, when he was in Pakistan, Imran Khan in the parliament, yeah. he said, "Look, he said if the, if there's an election tomorrow and this guy stood, he would win." Yeah. Yeah. So the point is for the Muslim psyche, if there is all you know, if we're building this person up so much. Mm-hmm. Then, if it comes crashing down, and especially if you look at the the, the situation in the Muslim lands, whether it's in Syria, Iraq, mm-hmm. the way they've devastated these lands, mm-hmm. he's probably you would say for a lot of Muslims the you know the 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 last light, yeah, yeah the hope they have. If you he goes, what? what 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 do you think? What impact will that have on Muslims? Just to to go back one step, but that says less about Erdogan and more about the Muslim mindset. Yeah, that's what I'm about. Yeah, the Muslim um, mindset. I mean, I was explaining this only in a talk yesterday. In, well, I went to a mosque yesterday. And I said that the last 18, 90 years, we have a, a victimhood mindset. So when Hagia Sophia opened, when Muslims were ec- ecstatic about Hagia Sophia opened, it came from a position of victimhood, which is that we haven't had many victories. And this is a global political victory mm. for us. And it made us excited. So uh, I was joking, but it's true. When Salah scores a goal, does sojourn, Muslims get excited. They do. Or when Habib is fighting, or Habib is fighting in UFC, they want to see a Muslim victorious in, in, in a sport of that nature, right? Because Muslims want to see Muslims being successful at something because mm. we need somebody that looks like us, thinks mm. like us, and represents yeah. our interests. In that sense, when Hagia Sophia opened, you can see Muslims were excited. But even those Muslims who are not excited, they were still coming from that same space of victimhood. But this time, the, the position was fear. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen to us, right? So the first group are saying, you know, 
um, this is great. This is amazing. Alhamdulillah, no more, you know, we're, we're not being downtrodden. Mm. We've done something. And the other, what the hell is going on here? Like, why, you know, we're Muslim. We're not supposed to do this. We're supposed to stay in our box, stay in our lane. So until we move out of that mindset first, and there has to be some sort of discussion amongst Muslims to say, look, we need to position ourselves outside of this lane a little bit. Um, then someone like Ardwan becomes irrelevant in the sense that if he dies, if he fails or he makes a mistake, we don't become that traumatized by it because we recognize as a community that um, the culture of Islam is sufficient and we can move forward. Right? That's the point. Yeah. So one of the things that we're trying to do then is Yes, in Muslim countries, the charismatic leader is so important for them. But it's to move away from the charismatic leader to some degree and focus on the machinery of Islam by saying it can just continue itself and so forth. Um, that's harder to do in any given society because you have to invest in people who have skills, who who are intelligent, who are brave enough to put themselves out there. Um, given the current situation in Turkish politics, I don't think that they're going to find another charismatic leader like Ardwan for a very long mm-hmm. time. He's a very unique individual in that sense. He's like Muhammad Ali in the boxing field, like in the sense that you, it's very rare you find these individuals who can mm-hmm. speak to the mass in that way. Um, but having said that, I think the Turkish political system is robust enough where they won't allow internal fighting to take place at to the detriment of the Turkish state okay. in terms of what's happened in the region right now. So July 15 did something in the Turkish mindset across the board, mm. whether you're secular, whether you're a nationalist, yeah. or whether you're uh, somebody who's perceived as Islamically inclined, that the state needs to be protected because we've seen what's happened in Syria. We've seen what's happened in Iraq and Libya. We cannot allow that to happen. Yeah, so the yeah. unique thing about Turks in particular is they can be bickering amongst themselves. But when there are moments where they pull together, they exceptionally pull together. And in that sense, that state might be a bit more robust than we give it credit for. So, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting yeah. what you're saying. I mean, because uh, back to what Madge was saying earlier about, uh, you know, uh, following a particular leader mm-hmm. and then obviously then you're taking down the garden path and all of a sudden you're just kind of thrown away, basically. And mm-hmm. we've seen it in the past. Yeah. Iran is a typical example where we saw the revolution. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody thought it was Islamic, Islamic mm-hmm. sentiments and everything. We've seen it before many mm-hmm. and many a times. And then what happened? It was all American. Everybody, mm. it was it was obvious afterwards, mm. and you know we don't want that to happen again. However, having said that, this situation, you see, what it is, we got to take things in. It's like uh, it, for for what it is. Mm. So when we look at Adran at the moment, it's interesting because he, at the moment, looking if if we look in the last few years, Muslims have no one to refer to in terms of a leader. And then anyone, so Adan has come in and he's quite close to the Muslim's heart, mm-hmm. whether it be in Turkey or anywhere around the world. And the reason is we have to just look at what he's doing for Syria. It's like you mentioned earlier, Turkey is like a safe haven. You said it's mm-hmm. a space for people to come mm-hmm. into. So it's a safe haven for Muslims like Syrians and, and all of these people to come. And he's got, he's got this, he's got this trump card, mm-hmm. if you like, over, <laughs> over, over America and everybody else because because at the end of the day, he's got all the support of the Muslims because he's helping everybody and everybody is very much touched by him. But that's and that's really interesting. Him, that's not restricted him. In fairness, that's part of Turkish Muslim policy. Well, that's nice. Um, I think that in regards to Syrians, I think it's still very complicated. I think mm. to be, a, I mean, I used to live in Syria and I remember the Iraqi migration. Migration is tough of that no, no, that level of migration yeah, to, the, to the hosting community and to the traveling community, mm. right? Um, I think in Turkish society, if you spoke to Syrians, they'll say they have a lot of complexities still and challenges. Having said that, I think Islam as a language still helps us to be able to speak to both Syrians, Kurds and Turks. So all three of these, not both, but all three of these communities, main communities and any other Muslim uh, group out there to try to remedy any differences we have, which that's a language we can't use in the West. So, for example, when Syrians are going through difficulties, we say, look, there's still our Muslim brothers in Islam. We're trying to make this work. Hang in there. Be patient. I'll let Ali give you sabr and so forth. We go to the Turkish community. Listen, there's still your brothers in Islam. They've come here. Be like the Ansar. We can make this work. Go easy. It's, so that language can be used. But there are still a lot of tensions on any given day because economics matters and yeah, identity yeah, matters. Yeah. And these mm. things, the Syrian migration has shocked economics and identity mm. in Turkey in that, given, in that sense. Um But in some ways, going back to the question that was asked, I guess 
Muslims still are looking for a particular given leadership. Yeah, um, I think that's what it tells us here then, I guess, globally, whether you're living in the West or the non-West. So let's look at India or let's look at China or Myanmar or let's look at Britain, France, America, that um, Muslim political agency is lacking. And the lack of Muslim political agency means that when there is somebody who represents some form of agency... Yeah. That is something that we just subscribe to. Now, as you said, that might not be the best form of agency in regards to when we compare him to our historical past. Yeah. Because we've constructed icons in our historical past, like say no Omar Radiallahu yeah, exactly. Omar bin Abdul Aziz, Abdul Hamid II, and so forth, yeah. Salah Din or whatever. We've created these types of figures in our mindset. So there's an expectation that our leadership should reflect that. Mm. But the fact that even here people are willing to give someone like Erdogan um, some leeway is an indication of what it is that they're yearning for. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you replicate that? How do you bring that back to the table? How do you create that consciousness where it's not that people are yearning for that type of leader, but people want to be that type of leader or that, that comes from within the community. Now, that's a lot harder to do, um, especially in in the time where everyone's living the day-to-day. Everyone wants to eat food. Imagine if you're Syrian. You don't have time to be this charismatic leader. You've got wife and kids to feed because you just come from war zone. So it's that challenge that's happening. I think what Turkey has done, and you talked about this safe haven, or the, I wouldn't say it's a safe haven, but it's a safe space to some degree, where it's given some of us the opportunity to talk about Islam in a way where we can think of alternatives, at least imagine the alternatives. That doesn't happen in other parts of the world because there's extreme pressure, psychological and intellectual pressure, mm-hmm. to not allow Muslims to have any thought process. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why Islamophobia is so strong in many parts of the Western world. I think that's the advantage we have in Turkey at the moment. That's not down to Erdogan simply. That's down to the Turkish culture in, its, in of itself. But it's still difficult. Um, so would you would you say um, that this Islamic emotion or feeling that we see in, in Turkey, yeah. would you say that uh, Erdogan mm-hmm. is a result of this Islamic emotion yeah. rather than this Islamic emotion being the result of Erdogan? I think it's a bit of both. I think it's give and take. I think Erdogan is a reflection of a particular movement in the 1980s, of which the pinnacle was the 1990s. But that wasn't only in Turkey, by the way. Mm. Um, so in Turkey, there was a military coup in the 1980s. So you have the revolution in Iran in 79, you have a military coup in the 1980s in, in Turkey, and a lot of Muslims were imprisoned and so forth, right? But as a result of that, that created a particular culture. So you have the rise of Arbakan and so forth, the Rafah party, the welfare party. And then you start to see people like Erdogan, Abdullah Gul and so forth coming into emergence. And they were a reflection of that period. That wasn't only there, by the way. That was global, actually. In the 1990s, mm. there were many Muslim movements, organizations, and thinkers around the world who had a lot of agency in the 90s because of this global feeling. Post 9-11... FIS in Algeria exactly. as well, yeah. Post 9-11, a lot changed. In Turkey's case, though, um, we start to see a movement on the ground of a shift where the AK Party finally in 2000s came into power. And then a, a shift happens within the Turkish mentality and psyche. Um, there was always a fear that the Muslims coming to power were going to do something extreme. And so that's what the AKP party or the AK party had to deal with for so long. Mm. Um, and they have had restrictions for so long. They didn't really get hold or grasp the reins of the state. They were always competing within the machinery. And then for any given reason, politics also happens and there's internal contestations and that's always going to take place. Um, but now... Um, we're in a very different space. And because of what's happening in the region, and I think that it surprised many of us in terms of the unraveling and the violence of what's happening in the Arab world, um, that um, Turkey has to make some choices. Do you feel, Gaku, mm. Gaku, mm. that this, uh, is the West mm. fear uh, what's happening in Turkey at the moment because you mentioned the fear within mm. of Islamic groups coming into power in Turkey. What is it perceived like from, you know, from what the West? So I think one of the interesting things about the West, and, you know, we've spoken very little about history, but I'm going to go into a little bit of history here, is that European um, identity has emerged from two, two things. One is the separation of church and state. The inter- so there was intercontestation among Europeans and European states and so forth. So the separation of church and state became really important. And the fear of the Muslim. There was a genuine fear that the Ottomans are coming. 
All right, and I've said this before, exactly the Turks, and the word Turk became synonymous with Muslim. Mm. So I remember when I was in Serbia, and the guy, um, the security, um, the the guy who che- checks your passport, uh, immigration officer, he was he kept asking me, "You're Turkish," and I kept saying, "No, I'm not Turkish." <laughs> and then he goes, "Your religion is Turk," and I said, "Oh, okay, that's interesting." Um, in South America, they call us Turco, but they're mainly people from the Arab provinces. Why? Yeah. Because that's how it, Thomas Jefferson's Quran is, they say you know he calls it the Turkish the Quran from the Turks um, the nation of Islam if you see a lot of their symbols they're taken from the Ottoman past okay? I was actually reading something a few days ago in India yeah people uh, this is like South India so yeah. place like the Muslims were called called Turks yeah yeah oh, that's right. me. exactly and so this word became synonymous Brexit they made posters that the Turks are coming Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the reason why I'm explaining this is because in the Western mindset, from just osmosis, there is the fear of the Turk, the fear of the Muslim. It's built into Western identity. Mm. Many of them don't even know it because it's so deeply ingrained. Mm. Muslims who are migrants living in the West don't realize that because they don't come from that same historical past. Their yeah. history starts from the moment they were born in Britain, whereas the Western identity, his memory starts prior to that. And so the point I'm making here is that that idea of the oriental despot, the idea of the fanatical Muslim, the idea that... So Hagia Sophia is an example of that, which is we can have a secular museum because that's objective, mm. but the idea that it can be a space for prayer, yeah. that's fanatical, right? When what's changed? Nothing's really changed except for now you're going to walk into a mosque and you're going to take your shoes off for the tourist. Mm. So you can see that mindset. So yeah. in that sense, that's deeply ingrained. And that's important in the West in terms of how far the Muslim memory stretches back in the West and how far the indigenous Western memory stretches back in the West of the fear of, of Islam. So Islam, Western identity has been built on two things. An internal threat, which was secularism and church and state, and the external threat, which was the Turk was coming. Right? That hasn't left. So I think when you read the newspapers, mm. even like The Guardian and so forth, you'll see how deeply ingrained and nuanced the language is in terms of making Turkey look like that the despot is on his way and, you know, it's all going to fall apart. And then... The Red know. Sultan. Exactly. And that comes from Abdul Hamid's period. Mm. And we who are Ottoman historians, put, put my Muslim sensitivities aside for a second, even Western academics recognize that that Red Sultan slur mm. was not helpful towards explaining Abdul Hamid II. This was deliberately used by the West as a way of diminishing his authority as a form of propaganda. So, you know, this fear that you're talking about... Um... And, for example, there was a, a magazine which was closely linked to the government, mm-hmm. which uh, spoke about, uh, you know, we need Khilafah, yeah. why, you know, why not now? And, you know, yeah, yeah. and anyway, pointing out Erdogan. So the fact that they a, a magazine uh, so close to the government mm. uh, said this, even though there was a bit of a backdrop from the, the, the AK party, but yeah. I, can't see, I can't see how they would have done this without mm. some knowledge. But nevertheless, you see that there are people in Turkey calling for this mm. to a certain degree. Then the Muslims globally, uh, you see pictures of um, our, uh, our President Erdogan mm. with the you know with the all the Ottoman yeah. gear on, right? So the the issue here is that you know you mentioned this fear that the West have, mm. okay, generally about the Turks yeah. and Islam. Yeah. Then two things. First of all, I mean, you probably answered it in a way before, but. Uh, the fact that people are looking for Turkey as being the next caliphate, yeah. okay, is that uh, totally unrealistic or, you know, is it going towards that way maybe? And the second point is that from the Western point of view, we see that the, the puppets of the West, mm. whether it's the UAE and, mm. and Egypt and these people, we see that not have they just um, all ganged up on Turkey. Mm. We even see the series about the uh, the... The uh, Sultan Selim against the mm. Mamluks, mm. showing the Ottomans in a bad way, which mm. flopped, which mm. Alhamdulillah yeah. flopped. Yeah. We see, you know, uh, uh, Suleiman Kanuni's name being yeah. taken off a street in one of yeah. these places. So we see not just the fact that uh, they're not just attacking Turkey as a national state today; mm. they're attacking Ottoman legacy. Mm-hmm. So those two things bring them together. Do you think that uh, it's possible? In some time in future, that Turkey is moving towards a caliphate, mm-hmm. and secondly, uh, do you think that the West are worried about this, or whether they, in on the inside, know that this is not going to happen? Okay, the honest answer to that question is I don't know, um, but if I was to speculate, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the interesting things I found was that when the formation of ISIS happened, there was an assumption 
um, that the caliphate question would now become diminished in the minds of Muslims because they would feel embarrassed regarding the violence that ISIS had committed. True. Yeah, that, I think, yeah. Right? But surprisingly, what Muslims did is they said, that's not a caliphate. Not, yeah. You understand? So there was, a, there was an expectation that Muslims would say, we're done with the caliphate. That's the caliphate. We don't we like don't it. We don't do want it. it. Yeah. But instead, I think there was a miscalculation both from Muslims and non-Muslims to some degree of the assumption that this would happen. And instead, what Muslims did Interestingly enough, he said, said, that's not the caliphate. So what did they force Muslims to do? Is go back into history and say, okay, then what is the caliphate? Which is a unique in that sense. Um, in the Ottoman, in the Turkish case, because they had an Ottoman past, and the caliphate question has always been part of the discussions of Turkish history, Ottoman history, mm. that's something that hasn't left them. So uh, the, Otto- the Turks in particular, who are religiously inclined, are proud of their Ottoman past. They're proud of their caliphate heritage. And in that sense, they don't want to diminish that heritage in any shape or form. So it gave them an opportunity to project the Ottoman past in some shape mm-hmm. or form. So that was one aspect. And I'm just talking about the Turkish case. Yeah, yeah. Right? The second thing about the Turkish case was the rise of television and art rule as a TV show. Big time, yeah. Right. And so that sort of soft power and popular TV show, it managed to grab a particular imagination, not necessarily of a caliphate, because art rule is not a caliph, mm. but the idea of a particular Muslim leader. And what the what the expectations were in terms of his morality, his ethics, um, loyalty, uh, and so forth, right? Strong, um, brave, and 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 this and and sticking and abiding to certain p- particular Islamic values. Whether that's realistic or not was irrelevant. It's just it gave an idea for Muslims that this sort of imagination was necessary. Mm-hmm. So when you start to see a, a a different shift was happening within Islamic circles in Turkey, but Muslims had been in power. Muslims are in power. So what's going on here? In regards to the the newspaper who were closely affiliated with Yeni Shafak, my personal opinion is I think they were testing public opinion. That's cool, yeah. Okay. Um, but there are still many factions within Turkish society. I think um, the fact that they were bold enough to get away with a, a test of that nature, I mean, they're not a big faction. Mm. So yes, they might be a faction close to the government, but they're not the only faction which are close to the government. And as I said to you before... Being in power in Turkey is a balancing act between various factions and various elite yeah, groups. Yeah, yeah. This was just a faction which used the emotion of Hagia Sophia, mm. knowing that now was a good time to put this out there yeah. to see what public opinion would be about. I, I, I'm assuming that's what they were doing. Yeah. And in some ways, it's interesting because yes, there was a retraction and a backtrack, but at the same time, there wasn't a visceral attack either. And that, once again, I'm not saying the caliphate's around the corner. What I'm saying is that I think Turkish society has become a lot more nuanced um, because of these series of things that have happened in the region over time mm. to not rubbish the concept of the caliphate as an idea. Whereas in the Arab world, um, there has been an attempt to totally distance themselves from that yeah. um, to some degree. And that's been interesting for me. Um, but even in the Arab world, I mean, when the formation of nation states happened, they wanted to distance themselves from the Ottoman past anyway. They, they couldn't. Whether they will be able to do this right now in a globalized world mm. is difficult to know. Now, having said all of that, does that indicate to me that Turkey's on the brink of another caliphate? No, actually, mm. because living on the ground, I think we're still a very long way off it. But what it indicates is that uh, Muslims still have an attachment to a particular Islamic past, which they're not going to let go of, or they're not yeah. going to denigrate in some particular yeah. shape or form. I think that's important. Yeah. I think we shouldn't be embarrassed of our Islamic past. And I think that's what we've learned, that even though a particular set of moves have happened in the region, that Muslims haven't felt embarrassed. In fact, what Muslims are doing, they are asking more questions. And I think that's yeah. interesting for me. So I know I haven't answered your question. I, I get that. But do you understand? No, no that's cool. I mean, in reality, I think the, the question of caliphate yeah. uh, may be uh, premature anyway. Yeah. The fact that, uh, you know, if you're looking at a, 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 as a process... Yeah. The fact that, as you mentioned before, that Giza, Imam Oglu, yeah. the fact that he's had to go to Ayyub Sultan yeah. and recite Quran. Yeah. And I think there was another t- Turkish sect, Kemalist, who said he prays Juma every day. Yeah. Um, so the fact that these guys are having to do this yeah. on the ground, it shows that, you know, that, that, that block of ice. The fact he prays is... Juma every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he said he prays Juma every day. I think he was. He was overly uh, Muslim, <laughs> but uh, what it shows is that yeah, this is something which I mean, like this yeah. newspaper we're talking about, yeah. this magazine. Maybe yeah. years ago they would have been locked up and and closed and probably. Oh, yeah, I mean, prison. look, I, I tell you something now that if Hagia Sophia had opened ten years ago, we probably would have had a military coup. Oh wow! Yeah, so I mean, you got to understand like mm. that 
move in that direction. So what does this indicate? This is why I'm saying, I, I, I guess what it's indicating is there is a segment even within the Turkish military that has recognized that this move is necessary mm. for the safeguarding of the Turkish Republic. Um, what I, I think what's happening in Turkey at the moment is a reconfiguration of the Turkish identity as a state and society mm-hmm. in which there is a synthesis between Turkishness and Islam. That's why I'm reluctant to say that there's a caliphate around mm. the corner. What I'm willing to say, though, is that um, just like when Imran Khan came to power in Pakistan, and he's calling it Naya Pakistan, which is New Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, model. Exactly. In Turkey, we're having this idea of Yeni Turki, this new Turkey. Okay. Okay. And why? And usually in Turkey, national identity was reconfigured by the military class. There'd be a military coup. And even the, the Turkish Republic was built by a military class group of people, right? Mm. And they were the ones who would fashion all identities. So who's promoting this new... Is it the, the AK Party or No, generally? this is just general ideas we're hearing on the ground okay. right now. So it's not in the same vein as in Pakistan. But what I'm saying is you're starting to hear this. But what you see in Turkey is under civil government that because of the Syrian co- uh, influx, because of the need of, of trying to define its borders, whatever those borders were, may be, because for the first time Turkish foreign policy is going expansion, not... Mm. Um, you know, standing neutral for whatever reason. That this idea of Islam, the reason why Islam, I guess, as a Turkish identity can work is because they can be seen as a neutral party mm. in, let's just say, for argument's sake, in intervening in Libya or being a middle party for Aqsa, Aqsa or yeah. going into Afghanistan alongside Pakistan as mediators. Yeah. Turkey can now be seen in those places as um, independent mediators, right? They're neither religious, Islamic totally, nor are they totally secular. They're in this middle ground. And so in that sense, for now, that's very advantageous, I guess, as a strategy for the Turkish Republic in regards to Muslim matters, right? In a world which Mm. is changing very fast. Um, And I guess that's what's happening to some degree. So this... In this sense, what I'm saying is that the Turkish Republic is is refashioning a new model. But as you said, why? What about Pakistan? Why is Pakistan going on the Medina model? So you can see that I guess some fault lines are being drawn. Like, how much of Islam do you want in terms mm. of your identity? Where certain states are deciding that we want to be a lot more inclined towards looking something more like the Western model, and we want to separate ourselves from. It. And others saying, actually, we've got these modernity things, but we can mm. pump more Islam in. Um, now, what that holds for the future, it, your guess is as good as mine. But um, that's what we're seeing. So we're seeing some clear fault lines, I guess. Yeah. So I mean, you know, you mentioned Afghanistan, Libya, and so mm. Um What do you think the uh, regional and international role is for Turkey moving forward? Because a lot, obviously, there's a lot of um, friction now. I mean, uh, yeah. there was uh, the issue to do with America and Turkey. Yeah. You can see that Turkey, some could argue that it's now independent of America mm-hmm. with the moves it's done, especially with Hagia Sophia. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why some of the nationalists maybe even backed it because it it, it showed that Turkey can do what it wants. You can't tell us mm-hmm. not to open some in Turkey. We can do what we want. Yeah. Um, so within the you know next couple of years or. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think is going to happen in Turkey? And, and is it, do you think they're going to expand their remit? Um, you know, just, the next, just your view on what do you think? I personally think the next five years are going to be one that we have to be very careful. Mm-hmm. I think people on the ground are concerned about that. I mean, so we've spoken about religion and uh, state and so forth. What we haven't spoken about is the economy. Yeah. And the Turkish economy has been hit really hard. Exactly. And that there's multiple reasons for that. There, there are external factors and internal um actions in which maybe the economy could have been handled better. Um, as a result of that, um, how do we look at Turkey in the next five years? Um, and how strong will the Turkish state be within the next five years? Mm-hmm. But I think from the failure of the coup in the July, on July 15th, at least there's a faction within both Turkey, the elites in Turkish society and the, the state or the deep state, whatever it is you want to call it, that Turkey can no longer just sit there as an idle duck and just be neutral. It's going to have to be a bit more um, progressive Mm. uh, in terms of um, uh, its regional actors if it wants to survive. So the issue of Libya is not just an issue of um, Turkey expanding its borders. It's it's about resources. So do you think these moves are a necessity for Turkey? I think think that's what they think. Mm. Yeah, I think they've calculated it like this. That when um, Trump came over to the Middle East and they were all putting their hand on that giant globe, 
Yes. Right? Yeah. One of the things that they realize is that, okay, this region is going to change. Mm. And certain states made a particular decision in mm. regards to the American administration, and other states were going to be marginalized. And I think in the case of Turkey, after July 15th, they've come to the conclusion, for example, that the north of Syria is something that they're going to have to consider, mm. which is going to change something regarding yeah. the Turkish state. Um, the issue of being hemmed in, um, uh, the issue of um, getting access to resources, the contestation of Greece, the issue of Cyprus. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think they've decided that we can. it's better to be proactive as a survival strategy mm. than to be um, static. Um, now, people may disagree with that, but in a, in a region where it's continuously changing, I can see why foreign policy has gone down that way. And this is the problem. that People keep looking at Turkey in terms of the internal policy, and very few people pay attention to its foreign policy. Um, and then there's states like Pakistan and Malaysia who uh, are willing to be partners with Turkey, not militarily, mm. but at least intellectually, by saying that, you know what, we, there needs to be a different wave in regards to Muslim states surviving, because at the moment, yeah, it's not working. Do you feel, though, that things have changed in yeah. terms of Turkey, they got a bit more muscle, as opposed to in the past, we've seen Muslim countries who grows and then they haven't been able to do anything you know, and, and they're just being kicked to a side you know, surprisingly, by Surprisingly, the people that showed they had muscle were the Taliban. This sounds really bizarre mm. because they outlived the Americans. They outlived True. the Russians. They're still here. They survived it and they made it. And not only did they, I mean, a lot of people underestimated. I'm not trying to promote the Taliban or not. I'm just trying yeah. to give you a diagnosis of that particular situation, which was that these people that are criticized as being just guys with, you know, random Russian ex Russian Klushnikovs and sandals out survived the Americans. And they did out survive. They learned English. They became intellectual. They opened up Twitter accounts. Mm. Yeah. And they out survived the Americans. What you sh- what they even uh, told you Dis- Disneyland. <laughs> There you go. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, they, they make, even when they're negotiating with the Americans, they're negotiating with the Americans mm. not as a weaker party, yeah. but as a party that has some level of authority. Now, I'm not saying the Turks have learned from that. Well, the point I'm making here is the Turks are not the only ones in the Muslim world who have decided to show some level of gumption by saying, you know what, we're not just going to sit here and take it on the chin. Mm. So it seems after the trauma of July the 15th, that the Turks have recognized that, you know what, we have to be a bit more front foot because if we're not front foot, we're just something else can happen here. I, 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 and I think Pakistan is starting to go down that direction too, by the way. I think Pakistan is starting to realize that, you know what, maybe militarily we might have to do something different because we've seen what's happening in parts of the Muslim world. I mean, there's loads of things to add. I mean, even the fact that, so I'm not even going to ask this question, but I was just, yeah. just to my mind, I mean, some people may argue that Erdogan only sort of acted in the way yeah. when Turkish national interest mm-hmm. within the, in regards to the Kurdish state yeah. uh, that Americans planning yeah. uh, came into effect and hence why he's reacting, not because of the the Syrians or Islam. Mm-hmm. Anyway, loads to discuss. Inshallah, maybe this is the first of many podcasts. Yeah. Jazakallah khair, guys. Jakala. Really, inshallah, taking the time out. And uh, for the viewers at home, uh, don't forget to subscribe and follow uh, our YouTube channel, uh, Voice of the Ummah. And also, um, we're available on all popular podcast platforms. Uh, Rashad actually said that without getting that wrong. Uh, but yeah, Assalamu alaikum to everyone at home and uh, Jazakallah khair for everyone. And inshallah, we'll see you on the next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget, you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.